President Truman became the president just after FDR passed away on April 12, 1945. Upon becoming the president, he knew that conflicts between the US and the Japan had grown exponentially since the attack on Pearl Harbor. Truman learned of the Manhattan Project, the secret scientific project that would create the atomic bomb. After the successful test of the bomb in late July of 1945, Truman issued the Potsdam Declaration demanding unconditional surrender of the Japanese government and warning of, and I quote, prompt and utter destruction. With no reply, Truman gave the green light and the A-bomb called the Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima August 6, 1945 at 8.15 a.m. local time, resulting in 80,000 lives within minutes of impact and many others due to radiation complications. Just three days later, due to a non-reaction of the Japanese government, the fat man was dropped on the city of Nagasaki. As a result, 39,000 were killed and 25,000 injured. From this singular choice, Truman decided that two cities were completely leveled within minutes of their deployment. And all the Japanese surrendered, thus resulting in the end of the war later on. Many still debate to this day whether this was a necessary dis decision, but we all know the ramifications of what occurred due to one choice. I share this story because it shows the impact of what it means to have one decision that can change the course of either history or of lives personally or those around you. In this passage, it speaks of how Joshua was gathering all the Israelites. He was gathering all the tribes. And the Lord gave him a message, and that message was pretty much, hey, we, I have given you this land, and I have given you what I have promised. And now I have delivered you into this promised land. So first, what we want to go over is God's deliverance. Let's go to verse 3. It specifically says, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And it says in verse 4, And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, I gave unto Esau Mount Sinai to possess Syria. But Jesus and J Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. This speaks of the Lord's deliverance throughout the history of the Israelites constantly. God has always stayed by their side. God has always cared for them. God is, it says in verse 3, it says he took for them. And in verse 4, it says he gave. And next, we see the Lord's protection. It says in verse 6, look at this word. It says, I brought your fathers. And it also says in verse 7 that he brought the sea unto them the Egyptians, meaning that he delivered them once they had been freed. The Lord's deliverance has been continuing throughout this life. The same could be said at Heritage Baptist Church. As we go to our, what is it? We're on our 24th year, if I'm not, not, not mistaken, and we're going into our 25th. We've seen how the Lord has grown and blessed our church greatly. This building is a testament to that. That building across the way is also a testament to that. God has always been there by our side. Whether man may say that we have not, because truly, to be honest, in the beginning, based on all the stories and what everyone tells me, we had nothing. And so God has truly provided. God has, made, God has done incredible things through this church. God has done incredible things through each and every one of us. And at the same time, this world, if they look at us, they're like, whoa, what happened? how'd that happen? the only answer that it possibly could be is through God. That's the same exact thing of the situation that we see when the Lord delivered the Israelites from the Egyptians. We see that through his protection, we also see the Lord's power. Look at verse 17. It says, For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people throughout whom we passed. The Lord has preserved us for 24 years. Arguably speaking, the Bay Area is probably one of the most wicked areas on this planet. 
Being at school in San Luis Obispo, it's a very nice town, it's a very cute town. But everybody knows, specifically in agriculture, um, it's a little bit different. Okay, you would consider people that I went to school with and were in class with as actual Americans, if that makes any sense. And so, they pretty much associated me, being from the Bay Area, as wow, you're just some blue flag flying kid who just loves some certain type of people. Um, specifically speaking, when I come from a different city, um, they're like, wow, you're a Christian? Oh, that, that, that's different. I was like, yes, praise the Lord, it is very different. And so we see how the Lord has used this church greatly. And it's only through his power that we see that this church stands here today. It is not because of man's work. It is not because of the teachers, of what they've done, or, 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 or pastor, humanly speaking. It is solely based on us relying on what the Lord can do. I stand here today because of what those before who have taught me, who have discipled me, who have poured their lives in to myself through the power of the Lord. Next, we see the Lord's grace. We see in verse 13, it says, And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye build not. And ye dwelt in them of the vineyards and olive guards which ye plant not do ye eat. It says specifically, giving you a land which ye did not labor. In agriculture, a lot of the times, when you're not working for something, you ain't going to eat. And when you're not going to eat, a lot of people are relying on people, specifically in agriculture, many of them have a lot of kids because it helps with their labor force, but um, <laughs> if you do not work for your food, you should not get food. And here, the Lord has been so gracious to these people. He says, hey, I've given you a land which you did not labor. That's just as plain and as simple as it can get. Each and every one of us have an opportunity. And we've seen over the past couple of weeks at our graduations and our banquets to celebrate the recent graduations and praise the Lord for each and every graduate. Um, it's a blessing and an encouragement to see those uh, focusing on and staying true to what uh, the Lord has for you, but we see that our deliverance starts at the cross. When Christ laid down his life for us so that each and every one of us would have the opportunity to call him our Savior and our Redeemer. I was reminiscing of the times of college decisions, college commitments. I know that for many who are seniors in, in high school, they're deciding whether what school, which university to go to. And each and every student usually has, okay, based on the internet, it says most kids in California pick around 10. So they usually apply to about 10 schools. And that means you probably have probably a top three, like that's a reach, like, hey, that would be amazing, like praise the Lord if we get in there, that would be, wow, you got in there somehow, praise the Lord. But then there's like a middle section where it's like, okay, that's a safe school. That's a safe school, but like, it is possible with my metrics or with how my application has gone, that will work. But then there's just safety schools where like, okay, pretty much everybody gets in. Like, hey, I, I better get in because, you know, my numbers are way higher than all those. And so we see that a lot of the times that there's a choice that must be made. There's a choice that must be made first and foremost by the applicant. The applicant must be willing to, first off, give money to pay for the application. Kids, thank your parents for paying for the application or if you have to do for it, praise the Lord. But um, you first, as the applicant, have to choose if you're gonna pay, if you're going to choose to go to the school. Second is the school. Second is the school. Is the school has a choice. Their choice is, hey, do I want this kid to be part of this campus, or do I not? Um, we see that some similarities, but often there are very few schools that have a 100% acceptance rate. I think everybody can come to an agreement with that. And we know that there is one specific thing that everybody has been invited to. There is one specific thing in this world that everybody has been offered. 
It is that of the choice to be saved. Christ has laid down his life for each and every one of us and has given us, each and every one of us, the opportunity to serve him and spend the rest of eternity in his presence. Before you leave this property, make sure you do so. Make sure you get to pastor. Make sure you get to one of the staff men. As Brother James had mentioned in his message, it says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father, says in John 10, 18. And so as we see that each and every one of us had that choice, praise the Lord for those who are saved. That is wonderful, and please um, share that with others. And oftentimes, speaking of back to those students, most students have multiple choices. Most students probably will get into about three, three to four schools, depending on just the circumstance of that timing. And so we see with those different type of choices, there are different type of results that can come from that. And we see in our passage, go back to 14 and 15 in our key verses, we see the Lord's prompting. It says in verse 14, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Specifically, look at that word. It says, now, therefore. Remember that in the first 13 verses, Jacob is, Joshua is going over what the Lord had done for them. He's going over how he has brought them through the land and to the land. And now, this is Joshua prompting them, saying, hey, now therefore, he's trying to get everybody's sense This is a complete change of tone of how he's saying, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity. Number one, we see fear the Lord. Do we truly respect how we ought to, the King of Kings, our Savior, the Creator of all? Are we living a life that shows our reverence to the Almighty God? Do we serve Him? Secondly, we see serve Him. It's a prompt saying that we ought to lay ourselves as servants, servants to serve. As we mentioned, do we have a heart of service like we ought to? both in sincerity and in truth. Sincerity being that of are we truly serving how we ought to be serving, as Luis so graciously presented earlier. Are we serving truly how the Lord ought us to serve? Or are we serving in our flesh? Are we serving for ourselves? Are we serving for others? Are we serving for the people around us? Who are we serving? Who are we serving? Why are we serving? Each and every one of us have a choice to make, a choice we see that Joshua prompted to serve the Lord, to fear the Lord, and he also prompted to put away the gods which your father served in verse 15. That word, put away, literally means behead. The things that are in front of you and to surrender them to the Lord. Each and every one of us have to make a conscious decision on whom we're going to serve. Just as Joshua prompted the Israelites, Will you wholly serve the Lord, or will you serve yourself? Will you serve other men, or will you serve the only rightful, deserving, almighty God? What is your main priority in your life? Is it your career? Is it the family that you have? Is it your possessions? Is it maybe your education? Is it a car? Is it your house? Is it the relationships that, are, that you've made on this earth? Is it your name that you've made, so to speak, in your career? When push comes to solve, shove, what would you choose? What is the one thing you honestly cannot live without? Each and every one of us ought to have God as the utmost essential relationship that we cherish on this planet. You know, oftentimes when being a student, you're bombarded, I, bombarded, bombarded is a good word, bombarded with decisions that you have to make. Decisions that probably no one else knows about. Maybe no one else has been in that scenario. But to be honest, if you go to the right council, other people have been in it. But 
but you may feel alone. Or you may feel tempted to make a split second decision. At that very moment in time, you have to go to the Lord in prayer and say, hey, Lord, I, I truly don't know what I'm doing. I truly don't know what you have for my life. I truly don't know why you have me in this situation. And I had that same thing. I had that same thing in my, what is it, second quarter of being in San Luis Obispo, California. I was just looking around like, wow, I'm in slow. It's slow here. Because, to be honest, it was a little boring. But the Lord made it very clear and very evident um, why I truly was it slow. Um, it, to be honest, it was not for the school. I didn't know, and obviously I didn't plan it because I didn't know. But it was because the Lord had other plans. The Lord had other plans, and I know I probably already told this story, but as Pastor mentioned, Pastor Ford, he called me one day, I think it was in summer, I think I was either interning at church or interning at um, a secular job, but he called me up, he said, hey Zach, you have a couple minutes to speak? And he pulls me aside and he's like, hey, we have this opportunity um, because um, circumstance came up where we need a new Sunday school teacher. And he was like, you will be the main contact point for that, and you will be establishing some sort of system um, some sort of curriculum um, to 15 kids. And um, he said, hey, pray about it. Uh, get back to me on Sunday. And um, after that week, that Sunday came, after praying over it and getting some counsel from my parents, um, it was very evident why I was in slow. It was to teach those who were coming in the near 15 years or so, 10 to 15 years. These kids range from 3 to 12 in the same classroom. So it was very different from how I grew up and just very, very foreign. But through it all, uh, the Lord saw that uh, many souls were saved, praise the Lord, and um, those who uh, were able to make the decision got baptized and are a part of the church. So praise the Lord for that. Um, but it was definitely a blessing in disguise of, of not knowing why I was there, the Lord most definitely confirmed why through um, just the fruit of what uh, we were able to see. And so lastly, we see that the people had chosen. The people had chosen. We see in verse 16, it says, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the, God, for the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Are we recognizing what God has done for us? Are we recognizing what God did for us on the cross? He died for each and every one of us to pay the debt that we couldn't pay. We see here that the people made a choice. The people made the choice to serve the Lord. It was so evident in the passage that how obvious it was that they were to serve the Lord. The same could be said about us. Do we have the right mindset when we're serving? Do we have the right priorities in our life? The choice is yours. Either you're going to follow the God of all, the God who saved us, who gives us eternal life, or you're going to serve this world. You're going to serve this world. You're going to serve your flesh. You're going to serve the people around you. You're going to serve, you name it, whoever. God's given us a great opportunity here in the Bay Area. God's given us a great opportunity opportunity that we ought not let fall away. Joshua then warns us, he says in verse 19, And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God, he is a je jealous God, he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then ye will turn and do 
you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. We can't serve two masters. Previously stated, it's impossible. Oftentimes, people that are in transition phases, whether that be from a different job, whether that be from either middle school to high school, high school to college, college to career, a career transition, whatever that may be, you're on a fence. You have two choices to make. Either you're going to choose option A or option B. Each and every one of us have a decision to make. And that decision, though it may seem at one point, it's a daily decision. Are you going to serve the Lord or are you going to serve something else that has higher priority? We secondly see a promise that was made. It says in verse 29, 27, And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Each and every one of us here preaching on a weekly basis, multiple times. Are we making decisions that are just off the cuff or emotional decisions? Are we making decisions and solidifying them off for the results of nothing? Are they going in one ear, one out ear, out the other? We have to make promises that we're going to keep. We have to make promises to the Lord and make sure that we hold that our end of the bargain. We have to make sure that we know that we can stand before the Lord with a clear conscience and Him going over all that we've done. Lastly, we see that they followed. It says in verse 31, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. We see that through this passage and through Joshua's life, it was an example of a man who chose to constantly serve the Lord, who constantly desired to do what was right, who constantly desired to be as close to God as possible. We see that when he was sent as a spy to spy out the promised land, that he was one of the two to come with a good report. He was then prompted that, hey, you have to now lead them out into the promised land. And he took that by the reins. And Joshua, through his life, he showed what it truly meant to be a servant of the Lord, to finish wrong, to finish well. Could you say the same? Follow the man of God's leading and his direction, and impossible things could happen. It didn't take long for me to notice, going through college years, of individuals that I've either grown up with or had friendships over the years, of choices that they followed through with that probably weren't the best decisions. And it's very evident today through just seeing how graduation of, of things changing of how the landscape of our world changes. Each and every one of us have a choice on a daily basis to serve the Lord or serve something else. What will you choose to serve today?